by God's mercy and grace. Welcome to New Haven Baptist Church this morning. It's great to see everybody here. Love you all. And love, great to see visitors with us today. Hope you enjoy the service. We're here to praise God, give him all the glory, honor, and worship that he deserves. Join me in prayer this morning as we begin to worship. Father, we're so thankful to be in your house. Father, we're thankful that you've given us an opportunity to gather together. Father, truly we know that Christ is with us everywhere we go. Father, we're so thankful for that gift of salvation that you gave to us, that nothing we can do to earn it, just to ask for Jesus to be in our lives and to be our Savior. Father, thank you for the many blessings, and Father, we know that there are many that are unfortunate that can't be with us today. We lift them up to you, asking you to have healing hands upon their body. 
Father, to have compassionate hands around them to show them love through tough and difficult times. Father, I pray that you'll encourage us to be their encouragers here on this earth. Father, in all things, we ask for your strength and your guidance in our lives as we go forth to do thy will. Father, today is the day that we proclaim to thee. And if someone does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, let today be that day that they open their eyes, hear his words, and accept the gift that you've given to them. They call upon the name of Jesus that they might be saved too. Father, I pray for those struggling on that fence that they come to know Jesus. Father, that they understand that he is eternal life and salvation through his resurrection. Father, today I hope that you take this service, and I pray that you will use Dr. Burgess to speak your words of truth to us that we can use them in each of our days. For in all things, Father, we give thee the glory, praise, and honor, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Bible tells us that Jesus 
is a friend that's closer than a brother. It says stick. It's closer than a brother. I hope he's your friend this morning. Let's all stand, turn around, welcome each other as we worship together. again we praise thee O God for the son of thy love for Jesus who died and is now gone above hallelujah thine the glory hallelujah amen hallelujah thine the glory revive us again we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We Praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. I hope you're revived today. I hope you're revived. Sing this chorus. Let's praise God our Father. Then sings my soul, my Savior. Me here singing. Let's sing that without music. Man, you all sound awesome out there. Praising to God our Father. Let's sing it without music. Then sings my soul, 
Gentlemen, if you'll come to receive this morning's offering. Let us pray. Father, truly, thou art great. Thou art great in love, great in mercy, great in grace. Father, we're so thankful that you pour each of those upon us. Father, we understand the many blessings we have have come from thee we understand that we need to give tithes and offerings back to thee and father we ask that you would take it bless it multiply it that thy name may be known throughout the world have us use it to give thee all the glory father today we ask that you bless this gift and the giver as it does thy work here on this earth for it's in thy name we pray. Amen. You know, Jesus Jesus taught us that uh, in, in his word that, um, that we should be out there telling people about him. And he said that the harvest is there's plenty of people out there that need to know Jesus, but there's so many few people that will go out and actually tell. The laborers are few. So I hope that, and I'm talking to myself as well, that we can be a better witness and a better light to help teach others and tell others by the way we live our lives and just witnessing to people, Lord, that we can tell people more about him. I used to think we had all the time we need Plow the fields, the plant the seed. But now I realize the dark and sky say night is stealing on. And while we wait, it's growing late. Today is dawn. Say not tomorrow, I'll hold to the plow, there's no time to borrow, it's summer now, the helpless millions reach out for mercy's hand, while God's still Searching for someone to till the land. So many die, never knowing why my Jesus came like fallen grain. We're all to blame. Yet in his nail scarred hands. There's a deed to a land of abundant yield And he seeks for you to join the few And work the fields Say not tomorrow Oh, I'll hold to the plow There's no time to borrow The summer now Reach out for mercy. 
mercy's hand While God's still searching for someone to till the land My God's still searching for someone to till the land Till the land Thank you, Johnny. That's as good as it gets, people. Hallelujah. Good morning. <laughs> How many of you would rather be right here this morning than in the finest, most luxurious prison in America? Can I say <laughs> amen? Amen. I would too. Just like you. Just like you. Turn in your Bibles to the first chapter of Philippians. Uh, if you haven't been with us on Wednesday night, you need to mark your calendar and start being here. We're doing a study through the marvelous book of Philippians. And as I was doing part of the preparation for laying out that study, came across a passage in it that I just said, you know what, I need to deal with that on a Sunday morning instead of a Wednesday night, and today is the day. So I want you to uh, be in, in Philippians, the first chapter. We're going to begin with verse 12 here just in a moment and read through verse uh, 26. But uh, first, I just want to, um, I want to suppose something. I want to just kind of set a, a scene in your mind. <clears throat> I want you to kind of suppose there's a big round table here and there's, oh, I don't know, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe uh, young adult, college age. Maybe uh, folks just sitting around there um, having a gab session, as people tend to do. And somebody, for whatever reason, throws out the question, what kind of life would you like to have? Hey, gang, what kind of life would you like to have? <laughs> now, you know, as, as, as people tend to do sitting around a table just having a bull shoot, Usually, you get answers to questions in waves. Have you ever noticed that? You know, the first wave, uh, people laugh and some will giggle and grin and, and they'll start giving, throwing out outlandish. And Well, first, what kind of life would I like to live? I can tell you that real easy. I'd like to win a $100 million lottery. That's the kind of life I'd like to live. Mm -hmm. Another one says, not me, I want to be a billionaire. That's the kind of life I want to live. Some guy says, well, <laughs> I want to marry a supermodel. That's what I want. <clears throat> Gal over here says, I want to be a supermodel. <laughs> Fellow over there says, well, hey, if I kind of life I want, well, I want to be the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. That's what I want. And then after that first wave of kind of outlandish <laughs> sort of answers, there's kind of a silence that passes over typical group and Somebody gets a little more serious and says, well, to be truthful, I'd just like to have a life that's got some purpose, some meaning. You know what I'm, what I'm saying? I, I just, you know, sometimes I just feel like I, I'm just going through the motions. You know, I get up every morning to go to class. Or I get up every morning. I go to my job and whatever I do, I get through the day get to bed at night, get up tomorrow, and just start all over again. <clears throat> I'd, I'd, just, I'd like to have a life that, that means something, that has some kind of a purpose, some kind of a meaning to it, something that just wasn't so empty and useless and aimless. And somebody else says, well, you know, I'd like to have that too, but I'd, I'd like to know that I could maintain it. I'd like to know that I could keep it going. Another wave of silence passes over the table and finally somebody sort of sheepishly throws out the question to the rest of the group. <laughs> hey guys, is it really possible to even have a life like that? And if it is, where in the world could you find it? Well folks, I got good news for you. It's not only possible to have a life like that, 
It's God's intention and purpose for you and for me that we have a life like that. And He tells us the secret to how to do it in this passage in Philippians. So pay attention. We're going to go through it and see how it can be yours and see how it can be mine. We're going to read Philippians, uh, first chapter, verses 12, and we're going to read down through about 26. <clears throat> Excuse me, so just follow with me as I read. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel." What then, notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also with Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by death, life, or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in a strait, Twixt betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful to you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you soon again. Pray with me, Father, in Jesus' name. I ask you to move me out of your way now and proclaim your word to us. Drive it into our hearts. Bring about the change in every one of us that you want to make. We'll give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Is it really possible to have a life like that? Oh my goodness, people, yes. And if you do not, I want you to pay careful attention. I want to show you how you can have a life like we talked about just a moment ago. I want to tell you first of all that God tells us in this passage of Scripture we've just studied that the kind of life that we were talking about that people want and desire to have and maintain is a life that is possible. That's the first question. Is it even possible to have a life like that, full of purpose and meaning and joy and value that I can maintain? Is that possible? Oh yes, it is possible. Well, what's the secret? Look at verse 21. Verse 21, Scripture says, For me to live is Christ. Say that out loud with me. For me to live is Christ. One more time. For me to live is Christ. <clears throat> Folks, I don't know if you understand it or not, that is great news. That means that for me to have the kind of life we're talking about, it's not up to me. It's not up to you. If for me to live is me, then I have a goal that is unattainable. I'm not smart enough to figure out how to have and to maintain a life that's full of purpose and meaning and joy, let alone a life that the Bible says I should have that is also filled with holiness and with righteousness. I don't have what it takes to make that happen. And I have bad news for you. You don't have what it takes to make that happen either. But the great news is, the assurance of this, is that this kind of life that God is talking about in this passage is not up to you and it's not up to me. It is up to Jesus Christ Himself living His life through us. God wants to give us a life 
that depends on Christ's almighty strength, not on our unmighty weaknesses. Hallelujah. It is possible. It depends on Him. It doesn't depend on you and me. You know why God wants to give us a life that does not depend on us? Because He knows we are not capable of either generating a life like that or maintaining one if we had it. Look at Romans chapter 7 verse 18 for a moment. The God's Word says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. In other words, I want to. I want to have a life like that. I want to be able to do it. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. It's just not in there, folks. The Bible says that you and I are born with a nature, a sin nature, that we got from Adam that makes us have a determination to rebel against God and do that which displeases Him rather than pleases Him. And I want to tell you that when you're living a life in rebellion against God, you cannot have a life that is full of purpose and meaning, let alone joy. Can't be done. Cannot. And God knows that neither you nor I, either one, possess the ability to either generate or maintain that kind of a life. So God has a plan. Awesome plan. Ingenious plan. Brilliant plan. A plan that no human being could ever have thought up. God says, I'm going to put my spirit into your body and I'm going to let Him live that life through your body and you are going to get to reap the joy and the glory of having it. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Paul, same fellow that wrote Philippians, said, I am crucified with Christ. In other words, the old me I was, just consider it dead. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Now, what's the mechanism? Here it comes. Yet not I. See, it's not really up to me. But Christ liveth in me. Now, what's the result of that? The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. You see? It's not up to me. Why is it possible to have that kind of a life? It's possible because it's not up to me to make it happen. God says, I want to do a supernatural work in your life. I'm going to put my spirit in your life. I'm going to live the life of Christ through your body. And you can have a life that's abundant, full of purpose, meaning, joy, a life worth living, and a life that can be maintained. It is possible. Why? Because God said, I'm going to take the responsibility for making it happen. I'm not going to leave it up to you because you couldn't do it if I did. Wow, that's good news, people. I'll take a big dose of that. All right? If that's for sale, I'd buy at least 10 or 12 of them. Okay? It's not for sale. It's free. It's free. It's a life that's possible. But not only is it a life that's possible, it's a life, this passage tells us, that is practical. It's a life that's practical. You say, Jerry, is this just some, some kind of theological discussion we're having out in space somewhere? Or is this really relevant to me? Folks, this is very practical. Let me show you an example of just how practical this is. Back in Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 12 and 13 and 14 again. He said, But I would you understand, brethren, the things which have happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Paul, when he wrote this, was in a predicament, and he'll tell us about it in the very next verse. It says in verse 13, So that my bonds... See that word bonds? You know what that means? Paul was in the pen when he wrote this. Paul had been imprisoned for his faith. He was in the worst of circumstances. He was in bonds. I mean, like change, you know what I mean? He was literally chained. He had chains around his ankles, chains around his wrists. The Bible says part of the time he was in dungeons, other parts of the times, he was chained with a Roman guard on both sides of him all the time during this period of time. Folks, can you imagine how depressing it would be 
to have done nothing wrong and yet be arrested and put in prison. Paul was in prison two, two three years at a time. In chains, literally in chains. How depressing would that be? Well, I want to ask you something. How practical is an approach to life that would enable someone, even in that bad of circumstances, <laughs> to be overcome with rejoicing? Okay? That's practical. You can, you can search all the books of all the human philosophies and all of the man-made religions in all the world. You will not find an approach to life capable of giving you joy in the midst of those worst kind of circumstances apart from this special life God wants to give us through Jesus Christ. You'll not find it any place else. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, that is practical. That's practical. If you have any sense at all, you should want a piece of that for yourself. And not only does the Scriptures tell us about a life that is possible, a life that's practical, Paul goes on and describes to us a life that is purposeful. People say, I wish I had some meaning to my life. I wish I had a purpose in living that's worth living for. And Paul describes one here that's uh, perhaps a little bit different than you've ever thought of it before. I want you to look back at, uh, at the, uh, let's see, at verse, well, I've just lost my place here. do 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 Verse 20, that's what I'm looking for. <clears throat> Somehow or another, my eyes just wouldn't fall on it. There it is. Verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, okay? But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be, what's that next word? Read it, say it out loud. Magnified. magnified. Say that again, magnified. All right, you want a purpose in life? Let me give you a purpose worth living for that will bring joy to your life all the time in any circumstances. And that is make it the central purpose of your life and my life that Jesus Christ be magnified in my body. Paul said that was his purpose. I tell you, that's a good purpose. That he be magnified. You say, Jerry, what in the world do you mean that Jesus Christ be magnified in my body? That's a group of words that doesn't even add up to anything I can understand. Well, let's just think about it. What does it mean to magnify something? I have a confession to make to you. I am a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. Okay? I, I, I'm a Sherlock fan. And, and, and I like every... I read the original... Uh, Conan Doyle, I've read them all over and over and over. I've read, I couldn't tell you how many volumes of, of uh, stories about that have been written since then. I even like some of the modern versions. I try to catch elementary when it's on. And, and I just like Sherlock Holmes. And you know, the thing, one of the things fascinates me about Sherlock is they'll call him into a, 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 a crime scene and first thing he does, he shows up on the scene, clears everybody out of the way, reaches inside his coat, pulls out a big magnifying glass about that big. And then he gets down on his hands and knees, and he begins searching every square inch of that crime scene with that big old magnifying glass. And what happens every time he does it, every novel, every book, every short story, every television show, every movie, He's got that magnifier. What does he do? He discovers clues that no one else saw. Why? Because you see, the purpose of a magnifier is to make significant that which the rest of the observers thought were insignificant. You see, they didn't think that those two little crumbs there had any significance at all. But when Sherlock Holmes put his magnifier on them, all of a sudden they were extremely important because they just happened to be a kind of soil that only occurred in one spot in London, England. He went to that spot 
caught the murderer. Why? He took something the rest of the world overlooked. But because of his magnifier, he saw how important it really was. Folks, I want you to know we live in a society and a world of people who go every minute of every day considering that Jesus Christ is not significant to them. That they can live their lives any way they want to, pay no attention, no allegiance, let alone worship to the God of the universe because He just doesn't seem to have any significance to them. And your purpose and my purpose is to magnify Jesus in such a way that when they see us and know us and hear us and converse with us, suddenly they see the significance of the God of the universe and His Son who was sent to die on a cross to save us. All right? That's what a magnifier does. It takes that which seems to be insignificant and suddenly shows the significance of it. And suddenly you realize, just as that little crumb was the most important thing in the entire case Sherlock was trying to solve, Jesus Christ is the most important fact and person in all of existence. And our calling, our daily purpose, is to magnify Jesus to the rest of the world. And then there's one other thing that a magnifier does. What happens if you take one magnifying glass and line it up with another magnifying glass? You get a telescope. You know what a telescope does? A telescope takes that which seems so far away and makes it near. I want to tell you, if we got, we've got Christian brothers and sisters in here who are aware that Jesus is so important and yet to their hearts and lives and daily schedules and lists of priorities he seems so far away folks did you ever just have times in your life as a Christian where Jesus just seemed like he was so far away well the purpose of a magnifier is make that which seems far away come close What's the purpose of our lives in Jesus? To be a magnifier. To be one that when people come in contact with you, the net result is that the Jesus who seemed so far away now seems very near and dear. That's purpose. That's a purpose for living that you can do every day of your life. That's a purpose for living that as God accomplishes it through you in His power and His strength, will give you a purpose for living that will fill your life with joy. It is a life that is purposeful. You want a purpose for living? There it is. But now what does it require for a magnifier to work? <clears throat> I got some bad news for you about those magnifiers. You cover them up with dirt, they don't work anymore. You take, you take Sherlock's big old magnifying glass and gloss it over with mud. You don't got to do Sherlock a bit of good. He can't make the in insignificant significant with that. Now the first thing he has to do is clean it up. You see, in order to have an effective magnifier, you have to have a clean lens. And that means that whatever's in your life that's dirty, whatever's in your life that's in rebellion against God, whatever's in your life that's taking your attention away from the Lord Jesus needs to be cleaned up, needs to be repented of, need to confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. It takes a clean lens. It also takes, to be in a good magnifier, it takes a proper focus. My son-in-law, Alan and Joe, one of the missionaries this church supports, and I thank you so much for doing that. Alan is a photo, one of his expertise, he's expert in more things than anybody I think I ever met. He's, he's a photographic expert and video expert. <clears throat> and... 
Two Christmases ago, my wife and I bought him this special camera that just reporters and professional photographers carry. I thought maybe they didn't do them anymore. I don't know, maybe they shot them all out of their telephone like everybody else nowadays. But no, they've still got those really, real high quality. And I said, Alan, how in the world are you going to use this? And he said, well, there's a lot to know about using it. It's so complicated. I couldn't even read the instruction manual, let alone work the camera. But there was one thing I remembered about it. And that is that when it comes time to doing all the focusing that you have to do to get that perfect professional picture, the first thing you have to do is you have to focus on the central object and get it in focus. And when you have that central object in perfect focus, then you know that everything else around it will be in perfect focus as well. Folks, you want to be a good magnifier? You've got to have your central focus on Jesus Christ. And everything else in your life will come into focus. Matthew 6, Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. <laughs> and all these other things will be added unto you. Takes a clean lens, takes a proper focus. One more thing I want to tell you about this life that God is offering to us in this passage of Scripture. Not only is it, not only is it purposeful, <clears throat> but thank God it is profitable. It is profitable. Jesus said in Mark 8, 36, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul. You know what the most valuable thing in the universe is? You know what the most valuable thing in the whole universe? Your soul. Your soul. It's going to live forever. It contains your mind, your will, and your emotions, but it's more than that. Your soul is more valuable, Jesus said, than all of the entire world put together. When our little group was sitting around the table in the first round of conversation, one said, I want to win the lottery, and the other said, I want to be a billionaire. I want to tell you that all the trillions and quadrillions that is in this planet added together do not add up to the value of your soul. That's what Jesus said. What will it profit you? have gained everything and lose your own soul. I want you to know that God wants to give us a life that is a profitable life. A profitable life. I want to tell you something that you may never have thought of. We all know who Bill Gates is. Bill Gates is a computer genius and richest man in the world. And I have a lot of respect for him in a lot of ways. But do you know something? Do you realize that one split second after Bill Gates closes his eyes in death, he won't have a penny more than you or I do. He'll be just as poor as the rest of us. And if he doesn't know Jesus, and I don't know anything about his spiritual life, but if he doesn't know Jesus, he will be as poverty struck as a person can possibly be. Paul says in this passage, for me to live is Christ. He goes on and says, but to die is gain. To die is gain. That word gain there in the, in the Greek carries the idea of more Christ. For me to live is Christ. For me to die is more Christ. Oh boy. Listen to me, people. If for you to live is anything but Jesus Christ. To die is to lose everything you have and are. If for me to live is money, to die is to lose it all. For me to live is fame, to die is to lose it all. If for me to live is power, to die is to lose it all. If for me to live is intellect or knowledge, die, lose it all. But if for me to live is Christ, 
to die is to profit more Christ. That's what Paul went on said in this passage. He said, you know what? I, I, I want to stay here and, and be here to minister to all of you in Philippi and everywhere else. But to be honest, for my own sake, <laughs> I'd really just go, I'd go on and be with him. I'd rather have more Christ. Because that's what living is. So I've shown you a life that's possible and practical and profitable and purposeful. The big question is, how do I get it? And that's the last point of my message, people. Because God's telling us about a life that is not only a desirable life, but it is a provided life. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't figure it out. You can't go somewhere and dredge it up. The only way you can have it is to receive it as a free gift from God Himself. Jesus said, I came so that you can have life and have it abundantly. You will not find abundant life in any other source in all the world but in Him. But it's a gift you receive. You see, the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. John said to as many as receive Him, to them God gives the power to become God's own children. Let me ask you a question. I've been describing a life this morning straight out of Scripture, and I simply want you to answer a question in your own mind between you and yourself and God who hears our every thought even when we wish He did not. And it is this. Do you have the kind of life I've been describing this morning? If you do, praise the Lord and start praying for everybody in here who doesn't. But are you who say, well, no, I don't really have a life like that. Would you like to have a life like that? Because God wants to provide it for you as a free gift. But like any free gift, it's not yours till you receive it. Till you receive it. God wants you to have it so bad, so badly, He sent His Son, Jesus, into this world to live a perfect life without sin and then die so His death could pay the penalty for your sins and for mine. And He was buried, He rose from the dead alive. And God said, anybody, whosoever, will turn from their sin and ask my son Jesus to come in and take charge of their lives. God said, I'll forgive your sin, I'll write your name in my book in heaven, and I will give you the kind of life that Paul's been describing in this passage in Philippians. And it's yours for the receiving. We're going to have a time of invitation right now. John's going to come lead us in a song. But you say, I want to know Christ. I want that kind of life for myself. I'm going to invite you to step out from where you are and meet me. I'm going to stand right here and just walk up to me and do just exactly what a lady did last Sunday morning. Walk right up to me and say, I want to be saved. That's five words. You can handle five words. Sit down with God's Word. You can go out of here knowing you're a child of God, possessor of eternal life, and have available to you the kind of life that Paul's talking to us about in this passage of Philippians. Or you're here this morning and you're a Christian, and you're saying, I'm saved, but Jerry, I, I don't have that kind of life either. Maybe you just need to come here and bow at these steps, kneel or stand or whatever, and renew your total surrender to Jesus. Because something in your life, something in your lens has gotten dirty and it needs to be cleaned and cleansed with confession and repentance and restoration. Maybe God's leading you to move your church membership to this church. Come up and tell me about that and I'll hook you up with the people that can make that happen. Whatever your need in Christ may be, you come as we begin singing. We ask you to stand. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you offer this kind of a life to us. And now we richly and happily receive it and thank you for making it available. Father, I ask you that every single person in this room right now who doesn't know that they know that they know that they have this kind of life in Christ would right now come and receive it as you provide it.
and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You a need in Christ, a decision you need to make. Step out right now. If you're in the middle of an aisle, we have a signal here. You just tap elbow. People get right out of your way. You come right on. You have a friend sitting next to you or standing next to you who needs somebody to maybe to come with them. Offer to come with them. But you come to Jesus right now as we sing. I come as God speaking to your heart you need to come as well you come on right now yes Lord I'm coming another verse of God speaking to your heart and you come right now. Yes, Lord, I'm coming. Another has come. It's God speaking to your heart now. This is your opportunity. You take advantage of it. Yes, Lord, I'm going to come in obedience. You come right now. hearts, you need to respond. richly bless every one of you. I want to invite you back tonight, 6 o'clock. We're going to do a Bible lesson tonight. We're doing a series of studies on the biblical basis of why we believe what we believe. Last Sunday night, we looked at the Trinity. And uh, I don't know about you, but I got a lot out of that lesson. I hope you did too. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at the revealing of God. The revealing of God. That's kind of a curious idea. Well, come see what it's about. I think you'll find it most fascinating.